Mark Sarkeesian, Rupa Garai, SOM, thanks for joining us. So Pinfuse Seismic Systems is the winner of this year's Innovation Award at CTBUH. First, just tell us what Pinfuse Seismic Systems are and how they work. So if two buildings, otherwise the same, one has uh, Pinfuse Seismic Systems, one doesn't get hit by the same earthquake, how do they react differently? What happens? Well, I guess I can start. Um, the building that's designed today, typically, is, is one that dissipates energy in an earthquake through yielding of material. Um, and, and that yielding keeps buildings safe, um, but uh, creates a, a dilemma for us after, after the earthquake. Um, what to do with the building, uh, repair, perhaps have to, having to replace uh, the structure. So the pin fuse system is one that uses friction and allows joints to be fixed during most of its service life. So for wind events or moderate seismic events, joints are fixed. Buildings don't move. They may sway, but the joints don't move. Um, but when the big earthquake comes, the joints will rotate or slide, dissipate energy through friction, but not damage the base material. So the buildings can be put back into service right away uh, without having damage to the base structure. So protecting lives, number one. Uh, the second is protecting investment, number two. And number three, which we think is probably the most important in many ways, um, other than life safety, is uh, the environment. Because the, the carbon that's required to repair or rebuild is, is eliminated. So do they perform any differently in the earthquake, or is it what happens afterwards? Well, it's the f energy dissipation happens through friction, right? So when you have the conventional building frame system, there is a yielding. And so in order to repair that building, if it has gone beyond, uh, beyond the limit, then you'll have to take down the beams, which is a lengthy process which uh, goes through the downtime, correct? But when in a pin fuel system, you can just get into there uh, if at all you need to do something, you may have to retighten the bolts and you are done. Hmm. So what prompted SOM to come up with this innovation? Was there a particular case study or something someone found out about a building they were working on that, that prompted this? Or how did this come about? Well, I, you know, I think it's um, this, this whole idea of, um, you know, how, how do we do things better, right? How, how can we create uh, buildings that perform better in earthquakes? Um, uh, buildings that go on to beyond the building code. So we're looking for higher performance, um, ways that, uh, that, that we, can, we can protect the environment in terms of, uh, of, uh, of keeping buildings in surface, service, keeping people in buildings after the, the big earthquake. So I think that was, that was it. Plus just pure kind of passion, I mean, for research and, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, uh What's stated in the code is life safety. Buildings need to perform to life safety for a MCE level earthquake. But when you go beyond it, you need to think over it. Okay, when that one day, when that big event happens, what do we do with those buildings? And that's just thinking beyond. That's the next step to go beyond the code. Hmm. Can any building employ this system? Is, it a, is there a cost premium or a minimum height or anything like that? You want to start? Um, can any building, yes, any moment frame building, any, any brace frame building can implement the system. Um, and then cost premium, minimum upfront cost, but it uses basic steel metal plates. It should, once it gets rolling, uh, the cost, you know, once, peop, when, once people know how to implement it, it will be pretty quick and it will minimize the cost. Is it difficult to make the case to clients that they should go beyond the, the minimum requirements of, of seismic activity? It, it is a little difficult to start. It's difficult not just with clients, but also with, uh, with contractors, because some of these joints look different than what we, do, we use today. So um, there is, as Rupa said, there's a, a slight increase in, in cost. Um, but what we're trying very hard to do is to look at the life cycle of, of these buildings and look at um, uh, cost benefit of, of introducing these kinds of connections that in the long run pay off 
because this investment is protected um, and, uh, and the building is, uh, can, uh, can continue to be in, in use. So um, the initial steps are difficult, no doubt. And it's just like anything else that's new. Um, but we're making great progress with this. And um, uh, through a, a sort of a rigorous program of, of research and testing, uh, and we're even uh, involved with AISC right now in pre-qualifying the connection. So we hope that through this pre-qualification that everyone can use these connections and use them as they would any other uh, approved uh, system or component that's in the code, in the AISC code. So we hope that that'll happen soon. Yeah. Speaking of code, since we're talking about seismicity, I wonder if you have any thoughts about is code keeping up with the needs of, of earthquake prone zones? I mean, there's been a lot of worry that the Pacific Northwest, that San Francisco, uh, other parts of the world could, could see another big earthquake soon. I guess that's the nature of the beast. No one really knows when, but uh, do you think that there's a, enough awareness and enough being done to make sure that every building is prepared for that kind of event? I think the code has its own dilemma. They need to satisfy the minimum seismic demands. The code is the minimum guidelines. So it sets up a rule for minimum uh, performance. Not, it doesn't say what the high level performance is. It's up to the client to decide what performance they want in that building. So um, we are looking forward to work with the clients who look for high performing buildings. You know, I think that, that there's, the industry is very interested in, in looking at the next step, you know, so there's a lot of research that happens worldwide to, um, to better our codes. Um, but uh, as Rupa said, they're minimum standards, and we hope that codes in the future will look at performance. So look at not just um, these life safety uh, requirements, but really look at what it means to perform better in large events, wind, typhoons, uh, tornadoes, great seismic events, and acknowledge good performance and acknowledge reduction of impacts on the environment like the emission of, of carbon, carbon dioxide. So someday we think that that is going to be part of what everyone considers when they look at designs and perhaps there are ways of acknowledging better designs even through building codes. So higher performing buildings may have greater value, for instance. Great. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. Thank you. Thanks.